Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us today and making TeacherCast your home for professional development. This is TeacherCast podcast episode number 206, and I am so happy that you guys are here making TeacherCast your home for professional development. We have had a great summer, and we are so looking forward to an amazing school year ahead. And I have a question for you guys. You ready for this one? How is your classroom? How are you setting it up? Are you creating a digital classroom? Are you finally taking that step this year to get yourself fully cloud-based? How are you doing it? What kind of apps are you using? We have a lot of those questions today on the show, and I have a fantastic guest from a great company that I had a chance to meet this year at ISTE, and we're going to be diving into ways that you can turn your classroom into a digital learning network, and we're going to go through all the steps. But before we get into all of that, I want to remind you guys that we've got some great programming this year on TeacherCast. If you're a technology coach, you can head on over to askthetechcoach.com. We release our new podcast every single Monday, helping technology coaches out there and if you're looking to bring podcasting or any kind of audio video into your classroom we have a brand new channel at podcastingwithstudents.com that's podcastingwithstudents.com learn everything all about the great things that are happening in audio and video and get it into your classrooms over at podcastingwithstudents.com so several great things that are happening this year check it out over on TeacherCast I am thrilled to have you guys here listening to our show now you guys have been listening to our show for a while now. You know that we had a great time this year at ISTE. I had a chance to meet an amazing company called Fresh Grade, and they launched a great new learning network platform, and we're going to be talking a little bit about it today. But most importantly, we're going to be talking about how you guys are going to be transforming your schools, your digital classrooms to make digital students. I want to welcome from Fresh Grade, Mr. Lee Wilson. Lee, how are you today? Welcome to the program. I am great, Jeff. Glad to be here. It is so nice to have you here. We had a great time at ISTE. How how was ISTE for you? How has the summer been for everything that you guys are doing over there? Well, we've been we've been super busy. Uh, uh, we we've, we've got our new platform out, and that's taken a lot of work in several years, and that culminated this summer. So it's been it's been a great experience getting that out. Now, FreshGrade, of course, is a great online platform, and I know you guys are, are used to working with teachers to create online portfolios, but you guys have recently created a new experience for teachers. Tell us a little bit about some of the adventures that are happening this year. Sure, yeah. So FreshGrade's been out for about five years, and over the course of that time, we've learned a bunch of stuff, and working with teachers all over North America, and we Basically, about a year and a half ago, we went into the back room and we said, let's take everything we've learned and let's build it from scratch. So we re rebuilt the whole experience. And as we did that, we really kind of reimagined everything we're doing. There's still a portfolio component to what we're doing, but it's really more about thinking about the kind of end-to-end -end learning workflow of the classroom and how we can use technology to support that specifically for students and teachers, not for other people in the school building. So... Now, any teacher out there that's looking to really jump into this, this is a great episode for you. So I want you to stick with us till the end because we've got some amazing things to talk about today. Now, Lee, you just mentioned the word end-to-end -end learning, right? Now, look, let's be honest. It's 2020. We've been in the 21st century now for 20 years. Aren't all teachers at this point online-based and web-based and why are we even still talking about this stuff? What do teachers really need to be thinking about when it comes to digital classrooms and digital learning experiences? Well, I've been doing ed tech for 30 years now. And one of the things, you know, we've, we've taken a lot of blind alleys over that 30 years as we sort of tried to figure out different things. Can, can tech do this? Can tech do that? And I, I always go back to... Um, a conversation that I had with a superintendent when I just got into ed tech. And I was with Apple and I sat down in his office and, uh, and you know, we had some polite chit chat. And then he, he took up uh, just a legal pad and a pencil and he pushed it across the desk at me. And he said, that's all my teachers need to teach. Now tell me why I need your fancy computers, right? And it was an awesome question. 
And it's, and it's actually kind of the thing I've been focused on for the last 30 years. So how do we really answer that question? What does technology do in the classroom that nothing else can do? You know, it, I, we don't want to sort of do plays on TV with tech, right? And, and whenever you see people doing new technology, that's kind of what happens. So, you know, the, the question's been what, what can we do with the tech to actually bring people together to sort of amplify the learning process to make it more powerful? And, uh, and so that's, that's really what I've been focused on and, and what I'm excited about talking about. So. You, you just mentioned amplifying the learning process. What, what does that mean to you? Because I've heard that term, but for you, when you say amplify, what, what, what are you talking about? I'm really talking about the students owning their own learning and really being more self-directed uh, in their own journey. Um, but in the context of the school and everything the school is held accountable for, right? So it's a, it's a many-sided kind of problem. So how do we do that, right? Because every teacher out there, and I'll say every, but I mean, you know, every teacher out there is in some form of learning system, right? They're using Google Classroom, they're using Apple stuff, they're using Office 365, they're, whatever it is. Every school has has their yeah. own environment here. And and I know FreshGrade has a great learning network together. So I'm going to kind of throw a bunch of questions in here. But when you say the word learning network, define right. what is a network to you? Like what, what actually goes into your digital classroom? So a network, if you think about all of the, the sort of biggest impact technology stories of the last 15 years, at the heart, they've all basically had a network connecting people. So, you know, whether it's, you know, Uber and Lyft connecting people around, you know, rides or it's Facebook connecting people with their friends or LinkedIn connecting people, you know, it's it, these at their heart, they're all networks. And you know, you see the enormous uptake. I mean, I, it's sort of hard to, you know, in my head to sort of wrap my head around the fact that the iPhone's what, 11 years old or something <laughs> at that point, right? So, you know, just everything changed so much once we were, once we were connected into a, into a much more rich and powerful network. So when we talk about a learning network, we really mean taking all of the technology that powers those social networks. But uh, I like the joke, you know, using it for good, uh, <laughs> putting, it, putting it to work in the classroom. And uh, there's been a lot of work done on stuff called network theory, and people can go Google that and, and, and do some research on that. And there's some really interesting implications for classrooms as we think about network theory. But at the end of the day, it's really about building a tighter connection between teachers and students in the conversation about the learning that's happening in the classroom. It's about engaging the parents more effectively in that conversation. And it's about informing administrators about what's going on in their school so they can see that in real time. So, so the, the, the tech coach in me has to ask the next logical question, mm -hmm. which is, it's easy to say we have this. It's easy to say companies like FreshGrade make this. And it's easy for superintendents to purchase it. Mm -hmm. How do we get our teachers to actually do it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> phone call. You can't. You uh, can't. You can't phone a friend on this one. <laughs> no. no, no. Um, so um, I, I get a little wonky here on you. I hope that's okay on, on the show. It's okay. Um, but you know, one of the things that that having sort of seen a whole bunch of things over over the course of my career, I think is important when you're thinking about um, tech and products that you're going to use in the classroom is thinking about the design DNA of the system. In other words, who was it built for to begin with? Because that really informs everything about the rest of the system. So we think about LMSs and we think, oh, those are built for the classroom. Well, really originally, because I was there when it was happening, they were about packaging and pushing the content that publishers had into the classroom. And yeah, there was some teacher stuff there, but it was really about transmitting the content to the classroom. Um, if you think about an SIS, you know, it's really, all about reporting to the state uh, and the accountabilities associated with that. Uh, and so, again, there's teacher tools in there, but but they're kind of a, out on the edge of it, not at the center of the system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things I look to when I think about the stuff that, that I've been working on over the years is, is this something that starts with the student and teacher experience and builds from there as opposed to trying to, you know, 
deliver somebody else's problem to the classroom. And, and so much of tech that we've seen is really about that, sort of dumping stuff into the classroom as opposed to starting the design process from the classroom. Now, what that means is if, you, if you've done that, then it becomes much more sort of natural for teachers to pick it up and use it because you've really you know, thought about, uh, from a design standpoint, what their needs really are. You keep using the word design, and, mm-hmm. and, and I think that's an important word, but I'm not sure it's a word that many teachers understand what the concept is. Many mm-hmm. teachers I still see, and th- this might be the tech coach coming out here, but many teachers are saying, I teach, and there's an online component. Mm-hmm. But that's not always digitally designing. That's not always teaching in the cloud. There's, let's really see if we can define things before we move forward here. I mean, te- teaching something that has a Google Doc does not necessarily mean digital learning, right? Correct. Correct. So, um, so what's the shift? So the shift is, it goes back to that question I talked about earlier, which is, you know, are you using the technology for things that you can't do any other way. So let, let me let me go to a sort of a different arena. I spent some time in the education gaming uh, space for several years. And I saw a lot of um, uh, uh, very expensive solutions to very simple problems there. Um, there are some things that games do absolutely brilliantly that nothing else can do. You want, you want kids to simulate running a nuclear power plant? We're not going to do that behind the gym, right? But I can do that in a game. Um, uh, but having a kid practice their, you know, number facts and whatnot, buy a stack of flashcards, you know, you don't, you don't need a computer and a monitor and a game and all that stuff to do some simple things. Um, uh, so thinking intentionally about the media you're using and what that media is best at, uh, is really important for teachers because we, uh, what I've seen a lot of teachers do is sort of spend a lot of time on something that wasn't actually sort of a best and highest use of their time, the students' time, and the the various tools they have in the classroom. Um, uh, You know, there are are ed tech Pied Pipers who tell you, you know, our solution will get rid of the need for, you know, everything (laughs) else in the classroom. And, uh, you know, I've I've been making this joke for years, but, you know, functionally, when a teacher gets up and uses a fancy digital whiteboard in front of the classroom, it is no different than using a piece of charcoal on a cave wall. Like we don't give up anything that works in learning because learning is really hard, right? Right. And and so as you're thinking about that, what's the mix of stuff I've got? Where does technology come into that mix and do things I can't do any other way? You're almost really defining the SAMR model, right? I, substitution, yeah, course, I mean, yeah. th- th- right? That, that's what yeah. we're looking at here is yeah. how do you, you know, substitution is instead of a pencil, I'm using a doc, you know, augmentation right. is yeah. as I'm taking that doc and maybe you're throwing three or four yeah. people on it, modifying it, And then finally R is, I keep thinking recapitulation because that's the music term coming out of me. Yeah. Um, but, but really it's, it's the, what can you do with technology that you just can't do anywhere else here? Now, you know, let's let's kind of break down some of the components here of what FreshGrade looks at here as that digital network. The one that you guys have been doing for a long time is digital portfolios. Correct. And this is something that I'd like to explore a lot this year on the show. And the concept of, you know, what is a portfolio? The concept of what goes into it. How do you then do it? I, I see a lot of teachers or, and even school districts say, we're going to do this portfolio thing. And then the kid goes from eighth grade to ninth grade. And what happens to it? It just turns into work that was done with maybe a grade or maybe not. So let, let's kind of mm-hmm. break this one down here. The simplest definition, Lee, what is a digital portfolio? The digital portfolio is, you know, the term digital locker has been used before, too. It's it's a it's a place for the work that's happening in the classroom to be sort of gathered and organized digitally. And when you do that, if you think about, you know, the difference between doing that, cramming papers into a backpack and having it in a searchable format on a computer, that's one of those things that the computer can do way better than the backpack can. Right. Um, So now. Is that just saying all of my kids' work is in Google Drive? That's a portfolio. 
or does it have to look at look like a website or a OneNote or a thing? Like, does it have to be this web URL that I can send to grandma? So there are different, um, you know, there are different ways and different types of portfolios. So it really helps to sort of discriminate between um, of the different kinds of portfolios and the different types. So, the, so at one level, you know, kindergarten, first grade, second grade teachers have used binders as portfolios for years. It's not a new practice, right? Mm -hmm. This is similar to the, the cave wall analogy, right? Um, you know, they gather the artwork and, the, and, the, and whatnot that the students are doing, they're writing, and they, you know, put it in a binder and you can see their work. Um, now, when students are doing work, there's kind of three different types of portfolios. There's a process portfolio that shows the process of my thinking over time. So I started a project, here was my you know, initial thoughts, here are drafts of my work as I go along, and here's my finished product, right? Um, there are assessment portfolios where students submit that final piece and it gets assessed. And then there are you know, capstone portfolios. This is more at the end of college and career readiness where I'm, where I'm preparing a portfolio of my best work and I'm gonna use it to you know, present it. Those are very different kinds of portfolios. Um, and, and the tool you use either allows you to do those different kinds of things or not. So, you know, Google Drive can be a portfolio. Sure, you can have a whole bunch of stuff there. Um, is it really searchable and organizable and, and you know, whatnot? Uh, I would say, you know, not as good as some of the tools that we and other people have built um, that are more purpose built around the portfolio concept. But it, but it is it is a good way to start. I've heard some people refer to a digital portfolio as a learning journal, which I really like that term. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And that's a term we use as well. Um, and it's and because you're not um, what you want to be able to do is both capture the work. So anything I anything I can point a smartphone at, <laughs> I can put in there. Anything I can link to, I can put in there. So I can take a handwritten worksheet, take a photograph of it, dump it in there. It doesn't have to be digital to begin with to end up in there, right? That's one piece of it. But the whole, the, the more important piece for the sort of uh, work in the classroom then is the conversation that happens around that. So the student uploads it and says, this is what I just did. Here's what I think I learned. The teacher responds with further questions, prompts. The parents might chime in uh, either, you know, directly in the app or they might chime in in the back seat of the car or over dinner you know right so they because they're seeing the work and they're able to comment on it so it's the conversation that really gets uh, gets us excited in terms of back to that concept about amplifying it's not just about capturing it it's about having a, a richer conversation with everybody who's involved around it I'm glad that you mentioned that because when we're looking at creating these things, you know, look, I, I, I'm going to say this in probably every podcast that we do. My kids are now in kindergarten. It's a huge okay. sentence for me, right? And <laughs> we are, are quickly seeing that even as a kindergartner, they're living in a digital world. And the stuff that they're going to be bringing home is not going to go on the refrigerator. So what do you do with it? And how do you show it off? And how do, how do you get it to grandma and, and all these different places? So talk to us a little bit about how teachers can can make digital still kind of be analog, but at the same time, you know, getting that, that community spirit. I love that you said the digital portfolios can be commented on by mom and dad. Cause I think that's a really, really strong thing. And, you know, again, maybe, I hope not, but maybe gone are the days where the kid gets off the bus and says to mom, look at what I did because they now have to open up a Chromebook and log into a website. And that might never happen. Why is communication, especially with parents, important for teachers these days? Yeah, so I, I, I uh, challenge you to walk into any room of adults in the country and uh, not have every single person in the room be able to tell you their bank balance within, uh, within a minute, right? They, they may have to enter a password, but they can get to it on their phone and they can tell you exactly where their bank balance is, right? Mm -hmm. um, in school, you might... If you had a sort of parent portal uh, approach to it, this gets back to us talking about the SIS and who it was built for and all that, mm -hmm. you might be able to get in and see a current grade. Um, but that's the equivalent of the bank showing you your balance only and not showing you the transactions that got you there, right? 
So what we really want is that real time uh, experience. So, you know, with programs like ours and our competitors, um, parents get a real time notification anytime something new gets posted. So I'm at work at lunch and I get a ding and I can actually see the presentation my kid just did in class because they recorded it, right? I get home, I don't have to ask what happened in school now. I can say, hey, I saw your presentation. I thought this was a really interesting point. Tell me more, right? That's a whole different way of interacting around the content. But what, what happens when a student comes home and says, what did you do today? And the kid goes, nothing. And the parent goes, but I've seen all your work. It's wonderful out there. Right. And that, and that comes to the, the parent and the teacher being able to communicate uh, as well in terms of talking about how do I, how do I draw this out of my child? You know, I've, I've seen the work. And, and then that parent needs to develop the skill of, you know, how do I probe and use questions and, and sort of dig in? Because I've, I've got something to start with. It's no longer, you know, my kids, they, what they said is, you know, what happened at school today? Stuff. You know, that was what I got. Right? Well, stuff is really unhelpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, but if I had if I had seen what they were doing, it would be I would be asking much more pointed, direct questions that are not yes no questions, and um, you know that, that that really opened up the conversation. So we're talking today to Lee Wilson from Fresh Grade, all about how you guys out there can create a digital learning platform and a network, really, of digital tools for your students. We want to know what you guys are thinking. Please reach out to us on Twitter at TeacherCast. This is. TeacherCast podcast episode number 206 and all of the links and everything that we're discussing today are on our show notes. Please reach out to us and we would love to continue this conversation with you. Now, we were talking a little bit about how to put these digital lessons together and it's still a difficult thing for many teachers. I'm glad you mentioned like the first and second grade and the kindergartens because I'm still of the belief, and this is the, the tech coach, and this is even dad coming out going, I don't want my kindergartner glued to a Chromebook. I want right. to have something on the wall. I want to see that refrigerator piece. Right. But then it always still comes to, well, then how do I show it off to grandma? So if right. we're doing analog work with our students, should teachers also then have a way to snap it, scan it, upload it, and document it somehow so that way it can be shared around? Or... Is that just too much work for teachers these days? So, um, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> um, Fair answer. Uh, so, so the yes part is it is too much work for teachers, right? So the, the change in practice that needs to happen is you need to empower the kids to do all that uploading, right? Mm. When, they, when they own the process of that, it takes it completely off the teacher. It frees them up to really focus on the conversation they're having. More importantly, though, this is, a, this is a really critical point, is it makes the student ask the question repeatedly again and again and again over the years of their education, what is the best example of my work? What is my best work? You know? So you, I, I, I know you're a musician. I am too. Um, you think about a, a, a way, the way we kind of assess music right now, right? Um, there's a recital. It's a one shot. Uh, you know, if you busted your reed on the way into the room, you're screwed. <laughs> um, uh, if you had the flu the day before, you may be, you may be not doing so well. Uh, with a digital portfolio, student goes home, they may do 20 takes. Then they have to decide which one of those is the best. So that process of them evaluating their own work is really powerful for learning. More importantly, when the teacher sits down to assess it, they know that what they're looking at is what the student thinks is the best example of their work. So that also helps enrich the conversation, you know? And so that's, that's a lot of what we see with, um, with, with, with the process. Now, uh, back to the question about the sort of analog pieces. Um, again, you know, we see a lot of teachers, you know, using worksheets, you know, kids are writing on by hand and then having the kids snap those using an iPad or a Chromebook or a, a phone or whatever and uploading it. Um, but the teacher needs a place. You need a structure and a place for that to go. So the teacher's workflow, you know, they can go in and assess all of those worksheets for the kids at the same time. It's not there's just this sort of random bucket of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's where tools like um, Google Drive sort of fall down as they don't have the structure to be able to sort of organize it for the teacher that way. Well, let's talk a little bit about FreshGrade here because I know you've got a fantastic platform. You just launched um, a, a brand new offering. How do teachers 
and schools get connected with FreshGrade and start bringing it into their students? So the, the easiest way to find us is freshgrade.com. Uh, it's our website, and uh, teachers can sign up for free, um, and, and it's always free for teachers. Um, and uh, obviously, we have a team standing by to talk to schools as they're thinking about it. One of the things that uh, we encourage people to think about is how to do this in teams, because back to the concept about networks that I talked about at the beginning, you want to act if you really want to sort of get the benefit of something like this, you need to activate that network. And that network is activated most effectively when all the students know all their teachers are in there and all the teachers know all their students are in there. Right. So um, so thinking about it as, you know, can we get a whole grade level to do this, to try it out? Right. As a, as a, you know, if your school wants to test it, I would encourage you to approach it that way instead of saying, well, let's do one person in fifth grade and one person in kindergarten and kind of see what happens. Right. Um, you, you won't see the network effects uh, that really start to happen when it becomes the way the work is done. So. If anybody is interested out there, I highly recommend checking it out over at freshgrade.com. Like you said, free for teachers to sign up and very, very easy to use, very, very quick to get onto the platform. I know you just launched this, but I'm sure you're getting some great and solid teacher feedback, parent feedback. What have you learned since ISTE? Because we were, when we when we met, you guys were just looking at this and, you know, recently you guys really open this up to the world. So what kind of feedback have you guys gotten and what can we look forward to with the system? So what we're, what we're hearing is, um, we, we heard from one major district, for example, that we were, were talking to. They, they had gone out to look for an LMS and then they saw what we'd done and they'd said, ah, wait a second, that's actually what we need. <laughs> um, uh, and so that was really, really heartening for us. And we're hearing um, from teachers, they love the, the thought of actually implementing new practice, richer practice, and saving time at the same time. Um, and we can go into, you know, why that is. But um, uh, so we're getting a lot of feedback about that. And then, uh, you know, from our existing users, you know, we're doing the things they've been asking us to do for three or four years. And they're all very excited about, about all of that and the new capabilities the, uh, the system has. Now, if I'm a teacher and I want to sign up for fresh grade, is this something that I can just log in and run with? If I'm an Apple district, a Google district, an Office 365, Microsoft, is like, does it matter what my district is using? Does it, is there integrations? Lee, how does this all work? So for an individual teacher, uh, you just go to the website and you log in and it works on any device. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, knock yourself out. Um, and then you also don't have to worry about, you know, what are kids using at home or parents have access. It's 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 it sort of uh, runs everywhere because it's in the cloud. Right. That's the nature of, uh, of, of one of the big benefits of being in the cloud. Um, we have a version for schools that they can implement and they can do a, a simple upload of all their rosters from uh, using a spreadsheet um, at the school level. And then we have a district product that has all the full integration with the um, uh, SIS rosters and the uh, single sign-on and all of that. So we have a, you know several different flavors. But for an individual teacher, the key thing is they can get started right now. They can go to the website, log in, and, and fire it up. I highly recommend any teacher doing this. It is a great platform, one that is certainly being used all around the country, all around the world here. Lee, you've got a great system here. Talk to us one last time here, because as a tech coach, as somebody who does a lot of professional development, it is... It is nerve wracking, right? A teacher comes to you and says, I found this. Can I use this? And you might sit there and go, I don't know what this is. I've heard of it, but I haven't tried it. One of the things on your website over at freshgrade.com is a nice tab that says professional development. Talk to us a little bit about what you guys have to help teachers, tech coaches, school districts, not only learn how to use this situation, but really support them in their in their implementation of digital classrooms. So we have a ton of resources on the site, a lot of them video, because that's what a lot of people want to use these days to learn. But we've also got articles and we've got how to's, getting started guides. It's all there in our learning center. And it really is suited for kind of uh, users of different levels of experience. So if you're, you know, if you've been using digital portfolios for a while and you want to try it out, there's some advanced stuff. If you're brand new to it, it's, you know, here's how you get started. Here's a way to maybe start engaging parents. We see 
you know, we, we actually kind of see how this unfolds in the classroom. And, you know, a teacher will fire it up and they'll invite some students in and they'll do a couple of activities and then they'll invite the parents in. And, you know, so it's a process that kind of unfolds, but at the pace that the teacher's comfortable with and that all the resources are there to help them kind of figure that out. Where do you see the future of all of this? I, I know as, as somebody who's out there building it, you know, you said you've been in education for 30 years. I'm coming up on <clears throat> 20 years of my own here. <sighs> I'm tired of hearing the term 21st century learning. Many teachers are, right? We're, we're almost a quarter way into the century. Yeah. We're but, either doing it now or we're not. So. Right, we're, 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 exactly. And, and I got to say, you know, and we, we talked about this at ISTE. Yeah. When I walked around the floor, I saw so many portfolio companies. And they all had their own versions. They all had their own philosophies. We've had a few of them on the show over the last few months but they're different, but they're the same. So what should a teacher look for when trying to choose an application for their digital classroom? What should a, what should a, a school look for when making these decisions? And I know you're the, you're the fresh grade guy, but, but you know, what, what should we be looking for when we're at shopping for digital tools like this? So I, I think the first filter you have to run anything you put in the classroom through is will this save teachers time? And you know, you really want to look at, um, you know, sometimes that means doing things in a different way, like I talked about earlier, where the students are responsible for uploading their content. And we have schools, by the way, just to be clear, where kindergartners are doing that. It's hmm. not complicated, right? You don't have to be in ninth grade to do that. Um, uh, you know, but again, many schools, the teacher kind of wants to do that. And, and, and so they sort of retain control of that. But what we often see is teachers sort of try and do it themselves, and then it gets too complicated. Um, so they then have to hand it over to the students. But when they do that, they save an enormous amount of time. So that's kind of the first filter you got to run through. The second one I'd say is, is we're talking to people, and you saw this at ISTE, you know, we, we've all seen it sort of building for years. There's app fatigue in the classroom. There's a, there's, a, there's a million apps that do one specific thing, right? And so the teacher's over here, and then they got to jump over here, and then they got to jump over here, and they got to have duplicate rosters in all these different places. And it, it is confusing for them. It's confusing for the kids. It's confusing for the parents. Um, and, and these are you know, great applications. They do what they do really well. But learning is a process. It unfolds over time, and there are different stages, and there are tools you need to sort of manage that process. So I would look to tools that help you Think about it from a process standpoint. One of the things, one of the reasons we shifted to the learning network focus, one of the things we heard is the portfolio is just one component. It's not really the whole thing they need. Teacher needs to be able to design the learning with lesson planning tools. They need the portfolio so the students can gather and organize the learning. They need a communication system so that they can share that instantly with parents and with administrators. And then they need a really robust grade book so they can fulfill their accountability requirements, but also more importantly, be thinking about what's next for the student, right? So you need all of those components if you're gonna sort of manage this workflow. And right now, if you go to the typical classroom, they've got a grade book, they've got you know, some communication system, they have a portfolio and they have you know, lesson planning maybe somewhere else. Um, and you want that to be as seamless an experience as possible, right? Where uh, you know, I can be in my grade book, I can double click on a grade and I can see the portfolio. I don't have to go hunting for it. I can see the work that was behind that grade. Um, you know, so that's, uh, that, that's what I would recommend. The other thing I, I, you know, just, I go back to what I talked about earlier, uh, at the beginning is it's so important from our perspective that we get people talking to each other more. Uh, and, and one of my, one of my mandates to our team is I do not want to see photographs of kids staring lovingly at computer screen. <laughs> I want them talking to each other. You know, that's what this is all about because learning is a social activity. And, and what we want to be doing is using the technology to amplify that social activity, not to replace it. But, but Lee, everybody knows the best picture that you could take of a student is over the shoulder with a clear view of their Chromebook screen. Come on. I, <laughs> no, it just drives me nuts. And it has for years. So. <laughs> the website is freshgrade.com. Not only do they have a great website, but tell us a little bit about where we can find you guys on your social networks, because you guys are all over the place doing great things to support your customers. 
Yeah, we've got a we've got a, a strong Facebook group. Um, we're obviously on Twitter and um, uh, uh, Instagram, and you know, so kind of all the all the major venues we have a presence. So whatever your flavor uh, or combination of flavors is, we're we're there, and you can find us. Um, but it all starts at freshgrade.com. That's the that's the place where you can find all of the information. You know, no matter what you're looking to do in your classroom, I, I hope that today's show was beneficial to you. I love the quote that Lee said, which is, this is all about helping you save time. And if we can do anything this year to save time, that means that you have more time with your students. That means you have more time for your families. That means you have a little bit more time for yourself. And if we can do that, then I believe that's where we want to be pushing with our digital classrooms. I know as a tech coach, that's something I've strived for. And, you know, saving time could be as easy as showing somebody how to make bookmarks on the top of their Chrome browser. Saving time could be figuring out how to use Google Classroom or create a, a better looking portfolio or anything like that. We want to know what you guys are doing this year to not only help save time in your classrooms, but really engage your students and give them meaningful communication with each other. There's, of course, several great ways that you can reach out and be a part of this and all of our shows. You can find us on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voicemail over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. And, of course, email us over at feedback at TeacherCast.net. Lee, I want to say thank you for your time at ISTE. It was great to meet you and your team. Congratulations on having such a great platform here. Don't forget, guys, Free for teachers to sign up. And Lee, I'll give you the last word here. What are you looking forward to over the next few months, especially as education turns and turns and turns and turns and turns and turns? Um, we, we are really excited to see all the amazing uses that teachers and students find for the, for the new platform. Um, you know, we know that anytime we put a new tool like this in the classroom, the world surprises us with, with wonderful things. So, you know, you talked earlier, uh, I'll just give you one example. You talked earlier about uh, involving the grandparents. We have many cases with our current, our, our, our prior product, uh, I'm not gonna make the shift myself, uh, <laughs> uh, where uh, parents invited the grandparents into the portfolio. So it wasn't about sending it to grandma and grandpa, they were getting the same notifications that the parents were. And, and so that communication across the family about the learning that's going on was, was happening there. So that's just one example of ways that teachers, teachers and parents and students surprised us with the, with the old platform. And uh, we're super excited to see what they do with the new one. So. And we're super excited to see what you guys are doing. Don't forget to check out all the great shows here on TeacherCast. Every single Monday, we have Ask the Tech Coach, our show for instructional technology coaches and helping you guys become better professional development trainers. If you're looking to bring on podcasts or anything audio and video into your classroom educationalpodcasting.com is a great place to check out and don't forget our brand new channels over at the educational podcast directory.com many of you guys know that apple recently pulled the k-12 category off of their apple podcast directory so i'm going to ask you the simple and silly question where do you go to find the best in educational podcasting and find podcasts created by educators for educators well the answer is educationalpodcastdirectory.com. Check it out. Over 140 educators out there making podcasts all in one spot for you guys to check out on your work. Once again, I want to say thank you to Lee and his team for coming on the show today and talking about the Digital Learning Network. We hope you have a chance to check it out. And on behalf of Lee and everybody here on the TeacherCast Educational Network, my name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students. 